pandemic, which in part explains why lending, firms has, lending to firms has slowed. By contrast, lending to households is... Our most recent bank lending survey shows that credit conditions for both firms and households have stabilized. Liquidity remains abundant. At the same time, the cost for firms of issuing equity is still high. Many firms and households have taken on more debt to weather the pandemic. Any worsening of the economy could therefore threaten their financial health, which could trickle through to the quality of banks' balance sheets. It remains essential to prevent balance sheet strains and tightening financing conditions from reinforcing each other. So, summing up, the euro area economy is rebounding strongly, but the outlook continues to depend on the course of the pandemic and progress with vaccinations. The current rise in inflation is expected to be largely temporary. Underlying price pressures will likely increase gradually, although leaving inflation over the medium term still well below our target. Our policy measures, including our revised forward guidance, will help the economy shift to a solid recovery and ultimately bring our inflation to our 2% target. Thank you very much. We're now ready to take your questions. Over to you, Falcon. Thank you, President Lagarde. And today, the first question goes to Balaj Korani of Reuters. Balaj, please. Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my question. President Lagarde, could you run me through your discussion on changing the forward guidance? We hear that uh, you couldn't get unanimity on the guidance two weeks ago. Did that happen today? Was the forward guidance supported unanimously, or, or was there dissent? How is this guidance different than what you discussed two weeks ago? Second question is about the Delta variant, which you mentioned a couple of times. Uh, we know it's more contagious, um, and UK, UK infection numbers are rising quite rapidly. Do you see a risk that the emergency phase of the pandemic will last longer than now many think because of Delta? Is Delta properly factored into your risk assessment? Thank you. Well, I will need at least an hour to go through all your questions because you cover huge ground. So let me uh, tackle your first question, which had to do with uh, how we uh, reached our, our decision in relation to forward guidance. Let me take you back just a little bit uh, to our uh, strategy review and the strategy, uh, the monetary policy strategy that we adopted uh, unanimously. And, you know, you, you have to think in terms of the strategy that we adopted as the framework within which we weave monetary policy. And there was unanimity on the framework. This is really the basis against which we develop monetary policy as we go, and depending on circumstances. So unanimity there. There was unanimous agreement around the table that uh, we had to revise uh, our forward guidance, and that forward guidance had to implement our strategy review. We did not have unanimity, but we had an overwhelming majority about the calibration of uh, the forward guidance on ECB interest rates. But that's what I had, anticipate, I had anticipated. And what matters most is the fact that directionally we were all on the same page and determined to re revise the uh, forward guidance as, as we did, but also to make sure that it is geared to implement uh, our, uh, our strategy. So that's very bluntly uh, how, it, uh, how it happens and what matters really is this chain of event, if you will, uh, amongst, amongst us. Now, you, you asked me to uh, sort of dissect uh, the forward guidance that we adopted. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take you through a little exercise of going through that long sentence, which is probably the one that is a little bit more uh, lengthy in the whole uh, presentation that I, I gave you. And it's a bit more lengthy because the forward guidance uh, rests on three key uh, criteria, if you will, or three, it has three legs uh, of forward guidance. And I'll take you through that. 
So, first of all, in support of our symmetric 2% inflation target and in line with our monetary policy strategy. So we are well anchored in our strategy. We uh, remind ourselves that we are um, targeting 2% inflation and our commitment is symmetric. The Governing Council. So it is not relying on uh, any kind of projections. It is the Governing Council in its judgment that expects the key ECB interest rates to remain at their present or lower levels until, and that's when it begins to be important. We see inflation reaching 2% well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. That's leg number one. And leg number two, durably for the rest of the projection horizon. And third leg, we judge that realized progress in underlying inflation is sufficiently advanced to be consistent with inflation stabilizing at 2% over the medium term. And we add to that a sentence that you might remember from the strategy review, which is, this may also imply a transitory period in which inflation is moderately above target. So, by these three legs, we're essentially saying, first of all, that we want to see inflation reach 3% well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. Now, you might say, what is well ahead? Well ahead, first of all, is determined by judgment of the Governing Council. But it is essentially the, the midpoint in, in our overall horizon. And just to remind those of you who do not necessarily know what our projection horizon, at the moment we project 21, 22, 23. So we want to see 2 at least 2% on the horizon, but well ahead of the end of this horizon. The second aspect is that we want that 2% to be durable. So we want it, and that's the second part of in the statement, it says durably for the rest of the projection horizon. So it, 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 it can oscillate a little bit, but it cannot go below uh, 2% essentially. And the third one, which is important as well, is that we want to look at the current circumstances, and in particular the current underlying inflation, to see whether directionally this underlying inflation components actually lead us into that upward trend that will help us reach the 2% target that uh, we are committed to. So you've got three legs. One that is in the present. You could argue that there is an element of outcome based in that one where we look at the underlying inflation factor and we see whether directionally we're aiming towards our target. Then we want to see it on the horizon, but we want to see that to have been sufficiently lasting so that essentially at midpoint it is already there. The third question that you asked me had to do with, um, with the Delta variant. And uh, on, on, that, um, on that particular point, our uh, projection from June actually included some assumption that certain containment and lockdown measures would be continued into the third quarter and some of it still remaining during the fourth quarter of uh, 2021. So it is factored into our projection and all the elements that we are uh, observing at the moment, whether it's by way of PMI or whether it's hard data, are really uh, confirming our, our projection for uh, the second quarter, which is coming strongly, and for the, uh, for the third quarter. So we, do, we don't, you know, we are in the hands of those who are going to take all the necessary precaution to make sure that uh, that contagion is not producing the um, negative economic effects that we have seen in the past. So vaccination is clearly one of the components that we look at carefully. The second consideration that we debated around the table, because it varies from one country to the other, is um, the fact that over the course of those waves, first, second, third waves, and now fourth waves, uh, the, the, the uh, citizens, governments, um, health services are getting a bit more used to the responses that must be given in order to address the health of people, but also not to damage too much the economy. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Annette Weisbach of CNBC. Annette, please. Thank you very much, um, President Lagarde. I have a question on um, 
how you see how the market is interpreting what you have said today. It's clearly seen as a dovish message that uh, rates and, and monetary policy will um, stay lower for longer. Would you agree? Um, and then I have a question on whether you have discussed uh, PEP and a potential change in the program once it is um, expiring by the end of March, whether you think it's needed that it has to transition into some sort of other program. Um, that would be it for now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I have tried to describe as well as I could the, uh, the, the forward guidance on ECB interest rates and the fact that it is really taking into consideration three key criteria over the space of time in order to make sure that we have uh, solid, lasting um, um, elements that, that will, will actually be useful uh, to guide our action. I wouldn't say it's lower for longer. I would, I would say that it's an indication that none of us uh, would want to tighten prematurely. I think we're informed by past um, experience and by most recent history. And I think this element of patience that you have between the midpoint and the end of the horizon and the fact that it has to not only be sufficiently early uh, and way ahead, as it is indicated in the forward guidance, but also lasting, is precisely intended to avoid premature tightening that would be detrimental for the economy. Um, so I think the combination of patience in order to gain confidence uh, is, is what we, uh, we discussed and what uh, we tried to embed in that, in that sentence. Um, on the rest... Essentially, I would summarize it by steady hand. So the use of our instruments, such as PEP, APP, um, has been steady hands because we conducted the joint assessment that you're all now familiar with, which is to assess the financing conditions and determine whether they're favorable uh, all the way through uh, from market interest rates all the way to household um, uh, loans, and then we uh, take a, a good look at inflation and its various components. So based on that joint assessment, which essentially is broadly in line with what we uh, saw in June, we decided steady hand uh, to keep this uh, significantly higher uh, pace of purchases compared with what we did uh, in, the, uh, in the earlier uh, month. But PEP, that was not discussed as, as a program, uh, and anything like that would be totally premature. So it was not an issue for debate. Thank you. And now to Carolyn Look from Bloomberg for the next question. Carolyn, please. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for taking my question. Um, President Lagarde, uh, your new 2% target was quite front and center when it came uh, to your plan for, for interest rates today. Um, you, you said that inflation should reach 2% well ahead of the end of the projection horizon, but your last projections in June actually saw inflation moving away from this 2% uh, target. So what are you going to do about that? And doesn't this imply that a more forceful response is needed? Um, and secondly, again, on this well ahead of the end of the projection horizon, you just mentioned that that means about the midpoint of your projections. So are we right to be looking more at the second year of your inflation forecasts rather than the first? And, and is there an understanding about what this actually means? Thank you. Well, I think it means exactly what is, uh, what is written in that statement. I know that it's going to take a little time to unpack it and really understand uh, all, the, all the subtlety and the, and the details of it. But it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we want the 2% on the, or at least 2% at the end of our um, projection horizon, uh, which, by the way, you know, varies over time. We, we do f uh, forecast... 21, 22, 23, but as you know, it slips into yet another year when we get closer to the end of the first year. So in December 21, we'll, have, we'll add an extra year. So it's a little bit um, misleading to say your first or your second year, which is why I prefer to adopt the midpoint reference in terms of indication. You know, it doesn't mean to say that it's cast in stone because by and large, the governing council will use its judgment 
uh, to, to apply that, uh, that criteria which I have mentioned. Uh, on, on inflation, let, let me remind you what, what we are doing at the moment, and that is really the second part of the discussions that we had today. Um, we have not changed in that respect, and we are still looking at making sure that we can preserve favorable financing conditions to all sectors of the economy, and that uh, we would counter any uh, tightening that would be, uh, that, 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 that would, you know, counter what we want to uh, realize in terms of inflation. What do I mean by that? We want to alleviate the downside impact of the pandemic on our inflation target. And that's, that's what we are aiming for with our PEP. Uh, PEP was for the emergency period of the pandemic. We are still in that period of crisis, which is why PEP is still ongoing. Um, we believe that any particular um, exit would be uh, absolutely premature in that respect. But our goal is to uh, come back to that pre-pandemic uh, moment and uh, the inflation target as we had it at the time on, in our forecast. Thank you. And the next question goes to Jean-Philippe Lacour of Agence France Presse, AFP. Jean-Philippe, please. Yes, hello and good afternoon, Madame la Présidente. I have Bonjour. two questions. Bonjour. On this guidance, um, it's a bit mis misleading uh, for me because in the pre previous guidance uh, until June, it was referred to the inflation outlook robustly converged. Now we can see it's written the governing council sees inflation converge, which can be misleading because the, my first understanding was that it is inflation effectively measured that is at, at stake. But um, maybe you can correct me once again. And um, the second question, um, we have this information, affirmation sorry, that the PEP will be conducted until the governing council judges that the coronavirus crisis phase is over. But what is the level of knowledge of pandemics about central bankers that would allow them to say one day that the pandemic is over? And what criteria would you be able to, um, yeah, which, which criteria will you use to assert that, yes, it is over? Thank you. Well, merci. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm again going back to the, to the sentence uh, that uh, encompasses uh, our forward guidance. We say in particular that interest rates will remain at their level or lower levels uh, until such time when the governing council uh, sees inflation reaching 2% well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. So it's obvious that it's the 2% that we see at the end of our projection horizon and therefore which is based on a forecast so it will be determined by staff forecast plus the judgment of the governing council, because we are saying here that it's not going to be mechanic. It is going to also leave some space for governing council uh, judgment. But it will be based on a forecast of what inflation is expected to be, the outlook for inflation at the end of the, of the horizon, which, as I said, is you know, either three years from now or a little over three years if we are at the end of the current um, calendar period. So I, I hope that clarifies uh, your concern. Clearly to have uh, in, inflation at the end of the two years uh, projection horizon requires that it be the outlook for inflation that we are talking about. Now, you, you write that the, uh, the decision that was made on March 18th in relation and that actually constituted PEP uh, indicates that uh, the PEP um, purchase, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, will continue until, until at least March uh, 22, uh, and such time when the Governing Council determines that the pandemic crisis is over. Now, we are not doctors. Uh, many of us are economists, uh, not all actually. Some are even lawyers uh, by background. But we are clearly informed, as you are, uh, by sciences, by experts and by the uh, observation of facts when it comes to, um, you know, employment, 
um, manufacturing, services, trade, uh, in the economic translation of what the crisis uh, is about. So that's, that's how we will proceed. And, and our hope collectively is that thanks to vaccination, thanks to determined action on the part of uh, all citizens, that pandemic crisis will be over sooner rather than later. Thank you. <clears throat> and the next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, please. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions and for this opportunity. President Lagarde, I have two questions, let's say, on uh, tools. Um, the Governing Council uh, revised the forward guidance on interest rate to underline its commitment to a persistent action, but there is no mention of the forceful action. Does it mean that the tools that then you describe and confirm are forceful enough? And and uh, this is what is implied, that the forcefulness is there. And then I have a question on uh, the targeted longer-term refinancing open operations. And uh, in the statement, you said that they remain an attractive source of funding, but you don't say anymore that they play a crucial role. Maybe I don't want to see too much into the words that you use, but um, how important is uh, Taltro's um, um, refinancing? And uh, oh, is there any forward guidance uh, on Teltros? Thank you. Well, let me clarify that latter point. Uh, we revisited and revised our forward guidance on ECB interest rates. That, that's, what, that's what we did. And, uh, and our exercise of uh, revisiting it was limited to interest rates. Uh, you asked me about the persistency and the especially forceful. You know, under the condition that we currently face, forward guidance can reinforce uh, our commitment to attaining the inflation target that our policy rate will be lifted only if the evidence is sufficiently clear, sufficiently persistent, sufficiently lasting, uh, and, and uh, we have the degree of confidence that our inflation rate will reach uh, 2 percent on a durable basis. Now, we don't only use forward guidance, as, as you know very well. Uh, the other instruments that we have in the toolbox and that we are currently using will continue being used. But the forward guidance is a way for us to operationalize our strategy review and to give sufficient guidance about that patience and that determination, but also about the exact criteria that we will need to see fixed, set, uh, reached, uh, in, order, in order for us to take any action on the uh, interest rate front. Now, you asked me about um, Teltros. This is not a matter that we have discussed on the occasion of, uh, of this monetary policy meeting. Uh, Teltro has been one of the two key tools uh, that we've used. PEP was one. Teltros, three, and the various uh, um, operations that we conducted were critically important to make sure that liquidity was abundant, uh, to make sure that uh, banks could uh, finance the economy. And we saw a very large uptake of uh, uh, the first few operations, particularly that in, in March uh, last year. The, the most recent one have, have been reasonable, but not as large, probably because there was already a lot of liquidity available uh, for, the, uh, for the firms and because some precautionary um, lending had been, had been put in place. What, what I would underline, by the way, in terms of, of financing and funding, is what we are finally observing for the first time, which is that the business that is coming back for loans is coming back for capex, is coming back for investment. And that, to us, is, is an, a very important sign that there is confidence in, in what is yet to come and in what the business will, uh, will hopefully, those, those investments will generate in the future. That, that's something that we will be looking at carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question goes to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Uh, hello, Madame Lagarde. Bonjour. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, two questions, if I may. One is on uh, PEP and your guidance on PEP. Uh, you say in, um, well, you repeat 
the guidance that um, that PEP purchases will be um, will be done to prevent a tightening of financing conditions that's inconsistent with countering the downward impact of the pandemic on the projected path of inflation. And you just said uh, earlier in your statement that uh, you have some way to go before the fallout from the pandemic on inflation is eliminated. Does that mean that we should not expect any time soon a slowdown in the pace of pet purchases? Uh, and secondly, what do you say to people who are concerned about the uh, possibility that you could be restrained in future uh, asset purchases by uh, the issuer limits, self-imposed issuer limits, and also the capital key uh, once the PEP ends and those um, restraints um, re-emerge. Thank you. Thank you very much for your two questions. On the latter, it's fairly straightforward. We have not discussed that particular issue, and there is nothing to report on that matter. On the, uh, on the pace of purchases uh, of PEP, we will continue to be guided by the joint assessment uh, that we have committed to, which is favorable financing conditions throughout the economy, all sectors included, and the outlook for inflation. Um, and on, on that front, uh, we are very, very attentive to all the components of inflation. And while we are seeing some, um, we have seen uh, some rise in inflation, 1.9 in June after 2% in May, uh, we also want to go underneath uh, that inflation to understand exactly what is going to move. But we have uh, some pretty positive signs in the short term, although the medium term doesn't look as promising. But I think all of that is premature, if I may say, because we will be uh, delivering our projection in September, which will be more indicative of what we see uh, on the outlook front in terms of uh, possible revision, and I don't know to what extent it will be revised up or down, but it will certainly have an impact on what we do going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Michael Rasch of Neue Zürcher Zeitung, NZZ. Michael, please. Good afternoon, Madame la Présidente. Um, with regard to the new strategy, um, one could also say that its uh, main goal uh, is to keep interest rates as low as possible for a long time um, and to shield Europe's finance ministers from market interest rates. Is the new strategy in this sense a sign that the ECB is under fiscal dominance? And the second question, if I may, according to calculations from some banks, the ECB could finance the entire budget deficit of the euro countries in 2021 as it did last year. Um, the net purchases of government bonds correspondent, uh, correspondent to the new issues. Uh, is that really not monetary state financing? Thank you. Well, thank you for your, for your questions because um, it gives me a chance to actually uh, reiterate what is the purpose of our strategy. Our monetary policy strategy is intended to deliver on our mandate, which is price stability. And what we have done, in addition to multiple other, other, other points, but you seem to be particularly interested by that one, is that we have revised our measurement of the price stability objective by clarifying the numerical target that we have, which is 2%, number one. Second, we have very explicitly indicated that it was symmetric and that deviation up or down are both undesirable. And third, we have very specifically uh, identified uh, the need when we are at the lower bound to take some specific measures and to react especially forcefully or persistently as we get closer to the lower bound. That is, what, that is the aspect of the strategy, um, the monetary policy strategy that I think is pertinent uh, for your question. And it is not intended to um, push into time uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the hiking of interest rate. It is not intended to keep interest rate low for longer. It is intended to deliver on our, our objective. Is it, it is intended to reach the target of 2%. This is what we want to do. And frankly, the quicker we can do that, the quicker we can use those um, are the tools that we have not used a lot in the last few quarters, which is the interest rate. But we are not there. 
So we need to take the action that is identified in our strategy review as now developed and operationalized by the forward guidance on ECB interest rates in order to deliver on the objective that we have of a 2% inflation target. We need to do that. We are at the effective lower bound. We need to respond especially forcefully, persistently. We need to observe our forward guidance that has now been approved. And if we do that properly, if we are determined, then we will reach 2%. And once we reach 2%, then other decisions will be made. But that, that's the purpose of our strategy review. It's not to keep low interest for, uh, for longer. It's to reach the objective that we have. So on, on the other one, you know, I, I just want to confront you to the counterfactual. If central banks had not done what they have done, if governments had not used the fiscal uh, arm that they had to use during the pandemic, what would have been the situation? What would have been the destruction of our economies? How many more people would have been unemployed? How would all that have stood the course of this economic crisis? So I don't think that the question was, uh, is it monetary financing? Is there fiscal dominance? I think we have safeguards in the treaties. Governments have safeguards and will hopefully work soon on the new framework that they have to safeguard their respective action. But we had to do what we had to do. There was no question in my mind that we should not have done what we did. Thank you, President Lagarde. Next question for Luke Hayton of Market News International, MNI. Ma Luke, please. Good afternoon, President Lagarde. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Could you give me a, a quick summary of the key arguments made by those who did not agree with today's calibration of the forward guidance? That was my um, first question. And secondly, at least one member of the Governing Council has gone on record recently as saying that the medium term is not two or three years, but rather that it's state dependent. Would you agree with that? You know, on your first question, I think you will be better off asking them. You know, I don't want to put words in their mouth and everybody is free to, uh, to, uh, to say what they want to say. What really mattered to me is that, first of all, we had a very um, friendly, open, substantive discussion around these issues. And, and the, the Governing Council was together on these. Um, second, our strategy which is the foundational document, which is our constitution, our framework, if you will, has been adopted unanimously by all members of the Governing Council. And all members of the Governing Council agreed that we had to revisit our forward guidance and that we had to frame it in such a way that we could deliver on our, strategy, on our, on our monetary policy strategy. Now, the calibration, uh, the, uh, the, the, the timing, the... Uh, all of that is, is, is a matter, it's not, it's not minimal, but it's the practicalities of a general principle that was agreed. So I think it's best that you, you, uh, you ask them the question and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very small number of governing council members, so I'm sure you will find their door as, as you will no doubt be very interested. Um, I forgot the second part of your answer. The medium term. Oh, the medium term, yeah. Uh, what the, we, we are, we are play, playing with two different um, time, if you will. A lot of what we are, um, that is anchoring our forward guidance is actually the projection horizon. So we are talking about, depending on when you start the clock, um, three or uh, a little over three years. That's the projection horizon, and that's where we have set our three legs, the three conditions, the three criteria uh, to trigger the, uh, uh, our decision. The medium-term horizon is, is probably a little beyond that uh, and is uh, also helping us take into account other uh, matters that have you know, nothing to do with inflation calculation, but which have to do with, with employment, with climate change, with factors that we have to take into account, but that are not specifically driven to inflation and our inflation forecast. 
Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is for Tom Fairless of the Wall Street Journal. Tom, please. Good, good afternoon, Madame Lagarde. Thanks for taking the question. And my first question, I, I wanted to follow up on what uh, Carolyn was saying earlier, that uh, you're projecting inflation will be 1.5% or lower next year and the year after. And given your new forward guidance, doesn't that imply that you should be you know, expanding your monetary stimulus straight away or soon? Or, or is it that you think that the new forward guidance itself will be enough? You know, should, there be, should, should there be something extra? And the second question was on house prices, which are rising very quickly in the Eurozone. I think the fastest pace in 15 years. Is that something that's concerning you? Is that something you should be thinking about or doing something about, given also your, um, your new focus on owner-occupied housing costs? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would not... Um I would not anticipate what our inflation forecast will be uh, next year and the year after. Uh, we, we, we know well that uh, forecasting is a, is a tricky game, uh, not a game actually, but it's a tricky exercise and I, I, would, I would certainly not anticipate. For the moment what we have is uh, a forecast in, uh, tw at the end of 23 of a, a, a sizable 1.4. We'll see what that is in September and I think that you know we have to take uh, each quarter of uh, projections as they come and then adjust what we need to adjust using all our instrument. And yes, indeed, we believe that forward guidance uh, is going to play a role in the set of tools that, uh, that we have available, some of which we are using extensively at the moment. But for the, as I said also, uh, we will continue to determine by this joint assessment where the financing conditions remain favorable in order to support the recovery uh, and we will uh, look jointly at uh, inflation and see what, what movement there is to be seen. So your second point was about the um, owners occupied housing costs. And on, on that page, I, I just want to signal that I have um, written to President uh, von der Leyen uh, to ask her uh, to please commission uh, Eurostat in order to accelerate the work that they do in order to capture uh, owners occupied housing costs for the future so that we have an, an, an indice that includes uh, the owners occupied housing costs together with other costs and certainly to take that into account better in the indice. In the meantime, we are also uh, taking into account uh, those, those costs using alternative indexes uh, when available. And this is a matter that we, uh, we discussed uh, a little bit as well in the course of our meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is for Esche Nelson of the New York Times. Esche, please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. President Lagarde, just a, a quick question on the APP. Was there any discussion around whether that also should be more strongly linked to the forward guidance alongside the forward guidance on interest rates? And then to your point about the transitory inflation, can I just ask for a little more um, information on what that meant by inflation being able to go moderately above its target and um, if there is any sense, kind of as the previous question asked, about what happens if it stayed below target for, for too long. Is there a point when that also needs to be needs to lead to more action? The, uh, we did not discuss uh, the, uh, any relation between APP and interest rates, and we really focused our exercise and the work on uh, our re revisiting and revising the forward guidance on ECB interest rates. So this matter was not for discussion today. Um, what do we mean by... Um, so there's the transitory period and the moderate, um, you know, inflation is moderately above target. And that is, that is often referred to as, as overshooting. So what we're saying is here is that we will, uh, we accept the fact, this is what is meant by this may also imply, we accept the fact that uh, inflation, that there will be moderate overshooting. And, uh, you know, Moderation is a factor of judgment yet again. Um, and 
you know, I'm not going to venture in any particular numerical assessment of what is moderately moderate overshooting as opposed to uh, excessive overshooting. I think what matters is that we accept it. We do not. It is incidental. It, it happens. Uh, we are not deliberately overshooting, but we recognize that the especially forceful or persistent uh, policy decision that we make may imply moderate overshooting. Thank you. And uh, our list of questions is concluded by Larry Laird of Mays News. So, Larry, please. Uh, thank you very much for taking my, my question, Madam Lagarde. Uh, two questions, if you, if you don't mind, and one is a, a bit of a follow-up, but you did discuss um, the lack of unanimity about the calibration of interest rates. Are you able to tell us what other opinions were expressed in those in those uh, that you mentioned? The second question is you, you also made it very clear that it was the revision of forward guidance, particularly in regard to interest rates, that was up for discussion today. Does that not risk um, any kind of forward guidance on asset purchases, particularly as we are seeing other central banks beginning to discuss that with their own forward guidance? Does it put the ECB out of sync with other central banks? You know, I'm on... on on our meeting today, I'd like to just come back yet again to the fact that the framework and the key agreement that we have amongst ourselves is a unanimous agreement. As there was unanimous agreement around the fact that we had to develop forward guidance, adjust it to the new circumstances of the strategy, uh, of the new strategy that we have, and uh, making sure that it is operational. Now, where there was some divergence, as I said, minor divergence, but they are to be respected. I think I've, I've been on record several times to say that it's perfectly fine uh, that some might disagree. And if the disagreement is at the margin, as it was uh, today, it, it, it reinforces uh, the collective uh, direction that, that we have discussed. But there was disagreement at the margin on the calibration and then you go into the choice of words, and you can write all the articles in the world about this, but what is really uh, important to me is total agreement and unanimity on the strategy review, and the agreement to disagree on the margin on the calibration of some aspects of the forward guidance. But, you know, it's not for me to sort of delve into that. I'm sure you, you, you're going to do your job and, uh, and try to figure out who said what to whom and all the rest of it. Uh, we did revisit our forward guidance on interest rates uh, of the ECB, uh, and that's all that we discussed uh, for the moment. So, thank you very much. By the way, I would be very keen to hear from you whether this uh, monetary policy statement is, is more palatable and uh, not overly disturbing for those of you who are used to uh, sort of identifying and redlining what word has changed here or there, because it's, it's, it's a significant change. but. Uh, I'm very grateful that all members of staff have made the effort uh, to make it uh, clearer uh, for all uh, those who care to read it. Thank you so much. And for those of you who take a break, have a great break and stay safe. Thank you very much. This uh, concludes our press conference today. The next scheduled press conference is after the summer break on 9th of uh, September. Until then, uh, we all wish you uh, a good break, restful vacation. Stay safe and healthy and a good afternoon. Bye-bye.